Hi, I'm Dr. David Spiegel, Wilson Professor and Associate Chair of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine and co-founder of Reverie. Hypnosis is the oldest Western conception of a psychotherapy. The first time a talking interaction between a doctor and a patient was thought to have therapeutic benefit. Yet despite the fact that it's been around for some 250 years, it is underutilized. Now, I know about hypnosis in part because psychiatry is something of a genetic illness in my family. Both my mother and my father were psychiatrists and psychoanalysts. They told me I was free to be any kind of psychiatrist I wanted to be, so here I am. My father was taught to use it in World War II when he was a battalion surgeon in North Africa to help soldiers with combat stress reactions and pain. So the dinner table conversations were pretty interesting, and I got interested, and it took a course when I was in medical school, and I've used hypnosis by now with at least 7,000 people, research subjects, and patients. In our lab, we've studied using functional magnetic resonance imaging as well as EEG, what happens in the brain when hypnotizable people go into a state of hypnosis. And we find three distinct brain changes that occur when people are hypnotized. The first is a reduction in activity in the anterior cingulate cortex. It's part of the salience network, the brain's alarm system. When you hear a loud noise and you shift your attention, that's your salience network saying, you better worry about that. The cingulate cortex is a C on its ends, right in the middle of the brain. And the front part, the dorsal part, is the alarm system. You turn down activity in that part of the brain when you're hypnotized. And that's great because it allows you to concentrate intently, to focus your attention and put outside of conscious awareness things that you might otherwise be aware of. The second thing that happens is hyperconnectivity between the prefrontal cortex, the executive control network, and the insula. Insula is Latin for islands, a little island of tissue in the middle of the front part of the brain that is a mind-body conduit. It helps the brain control the body. It also helps the brain react to feeling sensations in the body. We call that interoception. So you're hyper-connected to your body in hypnosis. The third thing that happens is inverse connectivity between the executive control network and the posterior part of the singular cortex in the back of the brain. That's part of the default mode network. The default mode network is your self-reflection. When you're not doing much, but just thinking about yourself and who you are, what you ought to be, who you, what people think of you, that's the default mode network in action. And it is inactivated relatively when you're in hypnosis. What that means is you can sort of turn off your usual assumptions about who you are and what you ought to do and try out being a different person. And that's a wonderful therapeutic opportunity. So hypnosis consists of three things, absorption, highly focused attention, um, dissociation, putting outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness, and cognitive flexibility, the ability to try out new ways of thinking about things. Uh, and it is what used to be called suggestibility. But suggestibility implies that you become a hapless, vulnerable person that somebody can manipulate. Now, we're all social creatures. We all take in input from others and believe some of it. In hypnosis, you're really able to just try out a new schema and see what it feels like, including a way of thinking about yourself and who you are. So that cognitive flexibility is a crucial and very helpful component of hypnotic experience. If you'd like to try hypnosis for yourself, Download Reverie, and please subscribe if you'd like to get even more hypnosis content.